The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you back to the Planet's Orchestration Analysis Series. This month, we're going to deal with Uranus, the magician. And there is a certain astrological meaning of Uranus to exemplify a mischievous creator god. So, kind of the source of naughty inspiration or something like that. That doesn't really matter so much in the context of what we're analyzing, except that I feel, in a way, this is Holst having a bit of fun with the audience. <laughs> kind of his tribute to British marching music, right? We had a kind of military march movement with Mars, which was kind of the end-all of... <laughs> pessimism about war and violence and so on. But this is more of that kind of pavilion-style British concert band kind of music. I, I think it's just really, really fun. It's kind of a slightly demented march with very strange harmonies for that particular time. If you'll remember some of the sources of Holst's inspiration for this, going all the way back to Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra, and, of course, it's not going to be as far out as Schoenberg, but it is going to play around with harmony in different ways and avoid certain traditional approaches to harmony and to form. But before we dive into that, let's take a look at the instrumentation for this particular movement. And there isn't a whole lot to say in a sense, it is the Orchestra of Mars, which you know we already looked at quite a while ago, with the horns of Jupiter, right? So pairs of horns rather than trios of horns working together. So this means that instead of one, three, two, four on a lot of unisons, it's going to be one, two, three, four. Kind of more of a film scoring approach, actually, when you think of it. Today's modern film scoring tends to disregard the sense of unity and the sense of teamwork that we see in concert scores in terms of the numbering and seating of the horns. So it's really nothing to worry about. It's just something to notice. And as I've commented recently in a tip on orchestrationonline.com, Sometimes the pairs of horns can work together really, really well. You don't have to pair one with three constantly. It's just a bit of a distraction when you assume that one and two uh, cannot work together on a high note, for instance. I think that you'll see appropriate types of pairings in this movement as we go forward, if you are more of a traditionalist. But just quickly, to go over this family by family, section by section, uh, pair of piccolos, pair of flutes, that makes our four flutes, and here there's a note that the second piccolo changes with bass flute, so we're going to see actually alto flute going to jump in there. Then we've got two oboes, English horn, bass oboe, and the bass oboe does get some interesting stuff to do, in fact right on the next page, or the next screen, as we'll see. Three clarinets in B flat, bass clarinet, three bassoons and double bassoon, contra bassoon, and as I just noted, six horns in pairs. Then we've got four trumpets in C, tenor trombones and bass trombone. Then we've got our pairing of tenor tuba and bass tuba, most of the time playing octaves and so on. Then we've got six timpani. This is set up a bit different 
from Jupiter, where there are three timpani per player. Here we've got four on the first and two on the second. And I think it's just so that certain gestures can be played by one player, right? It's just easier to have one player playing a four against a three in 6-4 time. Now, that's, that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Then we've got xylophone as our rare appearance of tuned percussion in this piece. And then percussion, they don't list them here, but it's tambourine, cymbals, snare drum, bass drum, and gong, which is actually tam-tam. Two harps, the organ makes a reappearance to play a couple of massive textures. And then, of course, strings. Now let's zoom in here, because our first screen is going to really just be about the heavy brass. And the horns can take a break. So we've got our opening theme, where it basically just states the first four pitches. G, E flat, A, B, and... I'm probably singing that completely in the wrong pitches. I do not have perfect pitch at all. And it's immediately reiterated by the tubas playing in octaves. Notice that tenor tuba in B flat, just to remind you once again, has the same transposition as bass clarinet in B flat. So everything that you read here is going to be down a major ninth, so an octave plus a major second. So this C-sharp is the same B that you're reading here, only an octave higher. So just think of this as being plus an octave. This particular part here is plus an octave of what you're reading in the bass tuba, if you want to cheat. And, of course, that is reiterated again, but at a different pitch at a different set of pitches. So E flat B F G is the same relationship, the same melodic curve as these other statements, only it is down a major third. Right? And it's a really good answer. It's kind of funny that when you listen to this, it sounds like one and a two, right? Because of the speed at which a four against a three would be playing at this tempo. There's Allegro. Let's talk about the orchestration of this, be it ever so simple. And starting off with basically looking at it as a simple octave statement in both trumpets and trombones. We've noticed before that there's a certain amount of conservatism in Holst scoring as to approaching notes down to middle C and below for C trumpet with Holst. He doesn't seem to really want to go down there very much, and perhaps the players of his time didn't feel that that was a very beautiful sound. While he does score it from time to time, he almost always supports it by other instruments. Here, there's not really a need to do that, because he's got four on a part, right, A2 on both staves, and they're sort of blasting away in a very kind of nails on a chalkboard kind of way, right? It's just really, really in-your-face type of scoring. And the same thing is true here for the tenor trombones and bass trombone. Notice that there are only three players uh, as opposed to the four trumpets, but even at that, the trombones are just as loud, if not louder, than the trumpets above. It makes a very, very firm statement, and a lot of times people are wondering how it sounds when all the trumpets and all the trombones play together very forcefully. And here's your answer. This is very, very well-placed scoring. It's right in what I would call the sweet spot for the lower range of the trumpets and also kind of the middle range of the trombones. Higher range for bass trombone, but, you know, not all that high. Still, it's extremely firm, and it's very, very focused, and it's not all that hard to play for the players in terms of 
you know, being able to get good intonation on those notes, and unless, of course, they were to just really go crazy on it and and get out of control with how much force they were putting in there. It doesn't need to be triple F or quadruple F here. It just needs to be a very, very focused, louder than loud sound, right? And that comes through fine. And this is also a chance for the conductor to show their stuff because they're directly controlling this series of fermatas. So they have to really tell the players you know, when is the next one coming. And there's a sense of ambiguity there. The conductor might want to draw out one note a little bit longer than the others just for emphasis in a passage of fermatas like this. So they are watching him. He is directly controlling them like a puppet master. And then right here, he's got to make sure that the tuba players know where the downbeat is and where they're going to come in on this syncopated statement here, right? Because he's going twos against threes. Dun, 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 dun. So there really is a sense of ambiguity about what the tempo is right here because it's not being told to the listener. It's not being showed to the listener at all. All right, they are first experiencing very, very slow notes. Then they're experiencing these uh, hemiolas, these twos against threes. And then they are experiencing a four against a three, which, as I said before, sounds like a triplet, like ba 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 bum. Okay. As far as the tubas playing octaves, we have looked at that in other pieces. But what I'd point out here is that Holst is pushing us ever more into a less focused sound, right? So this is an extremely focused sound. All seven of these players playing this, this is very, very harsh. It is, to a sense, very trebly. Then we have got our more ponderous sounding tubas. Uh, I mean, they're very agile, but they just sort of have a kind of an elephantine quality to them. So, in other words, less trebly, more bassy, and kind of having that slightly blasting through the trunk elephant type of sound. And then we've got our timpani, which is yet another type of timbral quality. It's got the ping to it, but, of course, it's being hit really, really hard, so that defocuses the sound to an extent. One of the things that you give up when you really hit timpani extremely hard is there's a slight sense of the quality of the timpani, that beautiful ping, and that sense of lovely intonation on a percussive strike coming unglued. And that's what Holst wants here. He doesn't want that sound that you hear in film scores where you have a very, very focused, uh, very precise timpani strike that is being turned up in the mix. Right? So the player is actually playing forte or maybe slightly above forte, but they're not really playing fortissimo. They're not really playing with this kind of wild motion. So you hear this very contrived kind of ping this kind of sound and you hear it more and more in film scoring nowadays where people want the sound of a particular film approach that may actually be their experience of what a timpani sounds like that's what it sounds like in their sound set whereas here you know if you really want to compete with this mass of sound from everybody the sound is wilder and i feel more earthy and less exacting, right? So those are some things to think about when you listen to this. Anyhow, let's have a listen to this now with the score, and I will see you on the next screen.
the music gets a fermata, just a breath, before starting the <laughs> sort of motoristic idea. Something that will keep the pace, right? While little bits and pieces of inspiration pop out. So I see this almost as a kind of background rhythmic pad that grows and develops and evolves while the different ideas and the different effects, uh, coloristic, um, different bits of theme are allowed to weave their way in and out. In that respect, I think that this is harmonically, mathematically very inspired. And as I've said before, I really don't have time to get into a lot of those aspects or else these lectures would be hours longer than they need to be. But let's just focus on the aspects of orchestration and scoring and so on. So starting off from an E minor chord in the bassoons, we have this little jaunty jig, or you could also think of it as like a 6-8 uh, a march, which is the way that I'm going to think of it as. It really just feels, like I said, uh, a bit of a tribute to British marching band music, um, albeit a very, very weird one for the time. Not so much of a big deal these days. I think it's a very, very cool idea for this particular voicing in this register. It's pretty much all um, low register bassoon. In fact, the top note of this F is the top note of the bassoon's low register. So it really stays within that more resonant, more rich area. Of course, it is marked piano, right? So at this tempo and marked staccato, of course, it is going to have a different character than a big, low, resonant, rich legato solo, right? It's going to come off as more comedic. And I think that is partly the intention, or I don't know if comedic is exactly the right word, perhaps like ambiguously mischievous, right? Because there's that sense of mischief in the astrological sign of Uranus. Bass oboe comes in to thicken the texture slightly, and it's a good place to do it right here. So the, a little bit of weight will be added. Something to notice here about the bass oboe part is that there is next to no suggestions throughout this movement of what to double, because in essence, the bass oboe is doubling everything, right? So there's, if you had to leave out the bass oboe part here because you just didn't have one, uh, then you wouldn't need to double this part with bass clarinet or something. It's, it's completely not necessary. Better just to leave it as is and to allow this thickening part to be just not worried about in context of the other instruments. So you will hear the bass oboe if you've got one, and if you don't have one, then it doesn't really matter because the music will just continue to progress, all right? Over the next three bars, Holst achieves a crescendo by adding parts rather than by getting louder. So he just makes the texture thicker. Now, here we finally get a crescendo leading to forte, but it's it shouldn't be pushed too hard too fast. This really should be a crescendo poco a poco and not just going from here, you know, from cool to warm in one bar. But an acknowledgement that the energy is going to increase. The trumpets are going to come in staccato, crescendo, and at piano, pushing up to here. And that's actually, you know, by the time they get to here, the sound of the orchestra might actually be mezzo forte, pushing towards a more definite forte by the beginning of the next page, or uh, the next screen in our case. We've got a bit of thickening to the bottom of the bassoons. We've got the bass clarinet sounding down a ninth. So this D is sounding down a ninth to C. 
and it is basically playing thirds with the bass oboe here, both of them doubling the bassoons. Meanwhile, <clears throat> an octave higher, the clarinets are coming in, and they are sort of taking over this sense of motion here and amplifying it, pretty much doubling the oboe and English horn. So it's just, you know, more doubling, more amplifying by just adding something higher and then um, making the original part a little less complex. Now, we get to this bar and the strings come in. Something that I want you to really think about with these strings is notice how simple the part is, even though you've got all this harmony going on. Now, does Holst need the strings to double every single pitch that is going on in the winds? He does not. And you know something? Neither do you. I'm seeing so many scores of you know, people sending me assignments and sending me uh, pieces they're working on and perhaps uh, their own arrangements of some orchestration challenge I might be holding. And they'll have uh, Divisi in two, Divisi in three, just in an attempt to really double every single pitch that some other section is doing. And you do not need to do that. Let's use that as the lesson for this screen as we start to finish it up. So what is doubling what in the strings? So the Divisi first violins, the top line is of course doubling with the flutes, the uh, bottom line of these fifths and sixths, that is by the time it comes in here, that is being played by the English horn. So notice that even though there is a bit of uh, somewhat doubling, somewhat not in the oboes, there is no need for the strings to try to replicate every single note. Every once in a while, the second violins will reach up and grab another note. This could just be played non divisi or it could just be a moment where the players divide the part and then just come right back together in unison. But really, there isn't a strong need for us to replicate every single note of this uh, woodwind chorale. In fact, the lower notes here are barely being replicated at all by the lower strings. We've got this F sharp here, which is actually uh, sounding an octave lower, right, because we've got the octave transposition, right, so so that would be F sharp right underneath these cellos, right, and that note is just an octave higher than this bassoon note here, right. We could pick it apart and just put every particular doubling in its place, but just suffice it to know that the strings are really just reinforcing and doubling the most obvious pitches of the entire scope of harmony and thematic development in this passage. Right? There just really is no reason to make it any more complex. And what is the secret there? What is going to be the result? Is that the strings are going to be heard because there are more on single parts. All right? It's a strange phenomenon, and I've discussed it before, and I should probably just do a big tip about this, but this is a situation where less is more when strings are playing along with a complex texture. This goes back to the approach that developed under Romantic composers, and that was to have strings playing octaves when brass and winds were doing more complex, loud things. And then you would hear the string octaves, probably reinforced by elements in the winds, and they would jump out at you, right? My belief here is that you could have the strings doubling every single pitch, and they would just start to disappear. You would just really feel more like winds. And then especially when the 
trumpets came in here, the strings would just completely be anonymous. So by holding off and just underlining the most important elements of the music in the winds, then we really do hear the strings nice and clearly. So that, to me, would be the magic trick of this page, of which there are really many. Let's have a listen to that. So notice the very grumbly sound of staccato bassoons in their low register. And you'll be able to hear the bass oboe in this recording. Uh, it comes through beautifully clearly. And notice as these elements are added, at piano, the music becomes louder in texture rather than louder in dynamically. It's just a sense of building on the tone rather than building dynamically. And then, of course, finally we get this push. And if I remember correctly, this recording does not really go for it and go straight to forte. It, it basically pushes throughout these four bars. And the trumpets come in very discreetly, but they really pick up a lot of energy going towards the end. And really, this entire screen takes almost no time. Here I am spending 10 or 20 minutes explaining it, and really it just goes by in a few seconds. So, let's take those seconds now, and I'll see you on the next screen. So on this next screen, we get to more massive scoring. And there is a little bit of trickery here in the strings coming up to this point right here where other elements take over. Horns and flutes and piccolos becoming more prominent as uh, octave doubling. And that tends to lend a bit to the illusion that the strings have sort of merged into the texture here. Uh, it's something that you don't probably notice if you're just allowing the music to wash over you, but that is kind of the effect there, is that the strings have just merged right into this bigger restatement of the idea. So as I mentioned before, horns playing A2 in pairs, and just playing this harmonized accompaniment. And trumpets, basically, you know, aside from this big push here on this B, it's just the first trumpet. And that is essentially providing the uh, third octave below these uh, flutes and piccolos. All right, so it's a very, very bright, crisp sound. And that is something else that kind of lends the illusion that the strings are going forward. In, in the sense that this is scored as a fuller texture, there is a bit of that bigger orchestral sound. But notice, I was talking about marching band and concert band. That really is something that's going on here. This is almost straight concert band scoring to a degree. I mean, not not obviously not using those specific sets of instruments, but in the sense of really just being uh, brass and winds, right? With a little bit of percussion coming in here and there. So, in essence, really, the strings are just being used to underline certain aspects of the theme uh, in important places, right? One of the cool parts about this section is this do do dee do 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 dee 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 um, just kind of leading to a less jauntily rhythmic uh, sense of momentum and kind of going crazy. And really, it's it's actually one of those things that if it were allowed to go on for more than nine notes, you would start to see the pattern in it. But it really is just a pattern built from compressing a lot of these chords and notes just into sequence. And it does start to repeat itself. However, 
throwing in these fours against threes makes it sound ever more random and of course climbing as it does higher and higher with the strings adding their particular element to it as well. Now notice that it is not a perfect copy of what's going on here in the piccolo and flute, uh, nor could it be to an extent. See how the trumpet basically lets go when the strings come in? That is telling you right away that the trumpet is sort of substituting for the violins in there and will sort of feel a bit like them leading from beneath, right? Although, of course, it's not the same timbre, but it's the same function, right? So a lot of times when you have not a similar timbre, but if you have a similar function right after dovetailing out of a particular instrument, you can give the illusion that that instrument is continuing on, right? And it's in this case, the violins. So it's really not feasible for the violins to exactly copy what's going on in the flutes and piccolos. And they actually would have a hard time jumping up to this G the way that the violins do, right? So it's really the uh, piccolo and flute that are compromising on the pitch, not the strings. The strings are playing the melodic arc in the way that it should be played. Same thing with this A, right? That A is being played by flutes, which is perceived to be a safe note by Holst, uh, which, of course, he could have thrown the G in there, too, really. It would, that would be even less dangerous, uh, you know, or would it really be all that dangerous for the players of his time? I don't know. But he chose to put that G in a lower position rather than in unison with the piccolos. So for whatever reason, that was his decision. And the violins just basically play around them. Now notice that once again we compromise in the flutes coming down to C sharp whereas the violins go up to C sharp. Right? And this is all being played from below as well by the clarinets. Right? They are basically covering some of these same pitches uh, along with the strings in less compromising fashion once you get to this bar, right? So, you know, here you've got these same notes here as played by flute are being played by the clarinets. And then here they come down right here, this D sharp, same as F natural in the clarinets and so on. So it's it all sort of uh, compromises and comes together, but it's just neat to see you know, how you can notate things between sections. The, the fact is that the sense of arc does not get subtracted by this slight compromise from time to time, and that's something that you should think about when you've got really high scoring like this for your flutes and piccolo, is that you can just spare everybody's ears a little bit and not have the highest notes in the highest position and still give the illusion that they are being played just because of the overtones, right? That's what's going on here. As to everybody else, it's just a question of how good your score reading is, right? And to see who is doubling whom and in what voicing. All right. So, for instance, here, remember your F horn transposition, everything being down by a perfect fifth. So... You know, this uh, D right here is a G, which is the minor third here in the bassoons. And then this B here is E, which would be an octave above the root here in the bassoons. And then here we've got G flat, right, which would be the same note as B, uh, interestingly, and harmonically, right? So that is that note there. So this is one of those cool things about horn with no key signature is that you can just assign the note that is the most convenient in the context of the line right rather than vertically along with the rest of the orchestra and it's much easier for the horn player to read in certain situations right this could have been f sharp f natural right but instead it's g flat f e as written right which ends up being to all intents and purposes being uh b uh, concert B, 
and then B flat, right? And then A, All right? Just exactly what's going on here. And it just happens to be more readable that way. It's just it's just a minor thing, really. It's this is nothing to get tied up into knots about. It could have easily just been F sharp to F natural, but anyways, it still it still looks good. It plays good. Then as this passage starts to push higher and higher, notice that it really is not gaining in pitch hugely, right? We we do see the horn starting to climb up here to G G flat in the first and second horns, and we see the bassoons going to tenor clef, uh, going all the way up to a G flat there, an octave below. But really, it's the sense of motion isn't really huge, it just feels big, right? And part of that is the clarinets kind of going into a higher place and the joining in with the violins and um, this these little tricks of, you know, playing down an octave when it feels like it's up an octave, and so on and so forth. So it's really just the flute and piccolo that are carrying the the sense of upward momentum as pushed from below, and clarinets, by everybody else who's just very gradually climbing, right? Um, and that just leaves, like, what is going on in terms of our bass? And it's really simply this tenor tuba here. Strangely, same thing, G flat, right? Just like our horn here but it is not the same pitch at all, uh, despite these really being notated the same pitches here, the third and fourth horns. And this is actually parallel fifths, right? Because this is read down a fifth, this is read down a major ninth. So this is going to actually sound E, right? So that is this note right here. So basically the bottom note of the bassoons is being doubled by the tenor tuba. And that is a good sound if it is not too big, right? If this tenor tuba just really wanted to push, then the lowest line of the bassoons there, the third bassoon, would basically just disappear as if it had never existed. So, yeah. But it does still make a pretty good balance with the horns joining in, right? So this provides a bass to the horns, and that actually is really nice. Euphonium playing in four-part harmony. Now, the build goes up to a drop-off straight into four-part harmony in the trumpets and xylophone. And I, I just feel that that's a really great setup, especially with this cymbal crash right here. And then, of course, the tubas coming in and reiterating that opening theme. And they have just a really big, nice, juicy sound here. And I love the alternation here, right here, going back and forth between some elements of rhythm and texture that came before, right? Uh, going back and forth between that and the trumpets and xylophone, which works great, by the way. Notice how the uh, xylophone is playing in between uh, the way that the trumpets are scored. So just taking every other note here, right? And it gives that sort of random pulled apart idea. Two against three. It's a really, really simple um, syncopation. One of the simplest in Western music. But it just still feels really off the wall because of the strange harmony that's being used and uh, the emphaticness of this just really on the beat playing by the uh tenor tuba bass tuba and then tenor trombone and bass trombone which right here very very fat juicy sound if you're hip to your tenor clef reading then you know that this c line right here the second line from the top is going to mean that this down here is a d correct right so that's d at the bottom of the staff and then this of course is d below that right below the bass staff so add an octave. So anyway, just think octaves if you're getting confused about that. And, you know, once again, trading off. I love the way that this, you know, bum, 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 comes back in and uh, xylophone starts to sort of play along with it and becomes more of a leading instrument. Of course, it is being helped out to a degree by the clarinets here, right, which are sort of taking over some of the function of the trumpets, uh, along with their own more 
full harmony and so on. Something that gets left out a little bit in in the perception uh, when people are score reading this, and that is this really cool idea here. A3 bassoons along with double basses, which really make a lovely, firm kind of a sound. Come in and play that bum, 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 bum thing again, right? Uh, but as uh, full dotted whole notes and you know, right below everything, while there is just a little bit of cushion here, there's a little bit of a pad here with the trumpets, just a little bit, these thirds here. And then, of course, the strings overall uh, play in these lovely octaves. So this is a triple octave, right? The uh, cellos and violas are playing the same note. And then we've got a stack of octaves from there. From this E, we've got the E in the uh, seconds, and then the E above that in the first. Let's take a little bit of the next screen now. And... There's the final note of that bum, 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 bum. Okay, now here we see, like I said, there, there was going to be just a teeny bit of doubling suggested for the bass oboe, but almost none, right? So here is, uh, here is a little bit of that tying things up. So let's have a listen to this now all the way up to figure two. All right, and listen for a lot of those features that I talked about, the um, the way the violin sort of seemed to disappear into the texture of this more concert band approach. Uh, listen for the tenor tuba providing a firm bass as it's doubling with the bassoons and of course uh, playing in four-part harmony with the horns as their root note and um, how the piccolo and the flute lead us thematically up there as joined from below by the strings and just this lovely idea of the xylophones playing along with the trumpets, going back and forth here between the rhythmic texture. And then after these statements, restatements of the theme from the beginning, we hear one more, which helps us to wrap things up under this trumpet pad, which is easy to ignore. And then these lovely octaves in the strings, which are very easy to not ignore. They're just very present. Okay. And of course, them dropping out lets this all sort of prepare for a more sprightly passage coming up at figure two. Right. I, that is something else worth noting is subtractions from the texture can change the whole energy. And that's what happens here. So listen for that as well and we'll come back to figure two. And now we get to one of my most favorite parts of Uranus, and that is this just fun little dance across registers and instruments and sections and lovely trading off. We're getting back to the whole sense of mischief, and I feel that some of this spirit got stuck into Mercury, really. Um, this is the genesis of some of that frolicking around. Now, all of these little solos that are dancing around mostly in reeds and in horns are going to be doubled by pizzicato coming from the middle strings, right, and cello here. Meanwhile, there's this lovely dancing back and forth. Once again, very simple three against two kind of idea here from harps, notice when they change keys, things sort of amp up and modulate right here. The first harp comes in and gives the second harp a break. 
so that the second harp has time to change one little pedal and doesn't have to worry about dealing with some changes over here, right? When it is in seven flats and the first harp is basically just, you know, in C major with a D sharp thrown in there. And then here it goes to D flat. So there's, you know, C natural and, and everything else. So that is just to say that this is doubling what's going on in the flutes and piccolos. And that makes a really, really nice combination the tone, especially staccato, tone of flutes and piccolos works really, really well with harp when we're controlling the dynamic. And a conductor who is really on top of it will get the flutes and piccolos to really balance well with the harps. Right? That, that'll just really seem like a seamless combination. Okay, so the sense of plucking joining together with uh, staccato in the winds, both in the solos and this little dancing accompaniment, right? This very sprightly accompaniment. So let's look at the wind solos, finally. Starting with bassoon, a beautiful low register solo. And that is being copied, imitated, answered immediately by bass oboe playing an octave higher. So just remember your transposition, right? This sounds an octave lower. So it's taking over, dovetailing right out of the end of the first bassoon solo. Here, the option is given of English horn, one of those rare moments when we really actually need to worry about a bass oboe part. And notice how it's all completely negotiable by English horn. This is almost as if to say that this is really just an English horn solo rather than a bass oboe solo because it's perfectly playable on English horn. And I'm sure that a lot of orchestras just do that and and get away with it and, you know, it sounds fine if you can't manage to get a bass oboe. In fact, if you have gotten a bass oboe for your performance of the planets and it just is not that agile, or the player is just not managing it very well, and they can only play a few of the slower, more sonorous types of solos, and this is really kind of not working out, then sure, the, the English horn might cover this anyway, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a possibility. And we seem to be trading off on F-sharp here, uh, written C-sharp, in the English horn, but it's just the F sharp uh, perfect fifth below, which is the same as this scored an octave higher because of the transposition, but it really is just this note here in first oboe. So notice how that has worked, right? We started with this low F sharp. We went up to F sharp below middle C, taken over here. Now we're going to go to F sharp above middle C, right? And the oboe is going to take over and just provide the crest of the arc here right, before ending on this F-sharp. And all along, Holst has been doubling those solos with pizzicato, as I mentioned before. Bassoon comes back in and develops that a little bit. Once again, doubled by cello. And I love this here. It's A2, not just a single bassoon, so it's fatter. And when it hits this G, it is doubled by third horn, right? Giving the third horn player something really third hornish to do. And that root is basically holding down uh, the bottom end of this just lovely bum, 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 this Paris police car siren sound. Um, you know, clarinets, it's very easy, but what's cool about it is we've got the clarinets playing an octave below the first violins, and it gives the illusion of uh, an octave in the strings, uh, which you may notice when you listen to it, right? It just, just putting this octave in here, the ear kind of substitutes the sound of strings there on the lower line. Then <laughs> we've got first horn taking over the solo, and this is in the position, not the same notes, but in the position that we just saw for 
bass oboe. So bass oboe started on F sharp below middle C, uh, going up a fourth to B just below middle C. Now this is horn playing higher because of the modulation right here, remember? Things modulated. This ended on a G instead of an F sharp, right? So everything has kind of gone up a whole step. So the horn is playing this uh, sounding concert G to concert C, concert middle C, right? So everything up a whole step from here. And ending on an E flat, right? Everything is just pushing up, pushing up, right? We were in the key of C flat major, and now we're in the key of D flat major. We went up one whole step. Ending, of course, on this solid concert A flat, which is providing kind of a root note below these oboes. And now the oboe is doing the, playing the same role as the first clarinet here, first oboe, playing an octave below and sort of standing in for the non-existent second violins. And, you know, this is just a trick that you can use, right, if you need to. Of course, not imitating Holst, but if you had a need to have your strings playing pizzicato, except you had your first violins, and you want your first violins to be playing octaves, you could just have, instead of going to VZ octaves with your first violins, you could just have the top part played by the first and the bottom part played by a wind instrument, like a, probably clarinet or oboe, just like it's being used here. I wouldn't recommend flute. But it only works because there's this kind of cloud, this flurry of notes happening behind it, and also because this is being played soft. The minute you get loud with this, the tissue just rips, right? It's like tissue paper, this type of texture. Turning the page, we see that clarinet takes over, and this is one of my favorite moments in this favorite passage. And that is first clarinet playing staccato, going all the way up to this high written G and, you know, coming down and ending up on a high written B flat. So actually sounding, everything sounding a whole step lower. But how beautiful that sounds doubled by pizzicato. There is a certain strange perkiness <laughs> to doubling high clarinet with pizzicato. And notice how just to make things even more slightly perverse, Holst doubles that with Arco first violins. It's just a sense of biting at your ear. And throughout all of this, the harp just keeps going back and forth, along with the piccolos and flutes, right? And then this little solo here, this perverse little solo, is answered by oboes. Ah, two this time, not a uh, solo as before. And Something about A2 oboes is that they become sort of trumpet-like and kind of harsh, and they start to lose some of that beautiful sense of poetry, right? Which is, I think, the main reason why people hate to go A2 on oboes. But here it works really, really good because it's very dancey, it's very staccato, and it's sort of trumpet-like. It's setting up this kind of rushing passage to come. So I think it works perfectly well. And of course, being doubled by violas. Very, very nice combination there. And then these clarinets here sit in for the background harmony as the violins go ba ba ba. And they don't really need any octave doubling at this point because Holst is slightly eclipsing his texture here to set up this wonderful bassoon contrabassoon and bass clarinet featured line. Let's look at that, and then we will listen to this whole thing, and then I will be uh, taking a break for a few days, and you can think about this, watch it through, and uh, absorb what you can. So let's talk about that solo. Pizzicato doubling, once again, in the lower strings. Notice that Holst is playing against the rhythm of the passage by putting in like a group of 
five, alternating groups of fives and fours, five, then ending up finally with that low concert A right at the bottom, right on the downbeat. I think that's just such a cool idea. And once again, we've got our disposable bass oboe part. We're just adding a little bit of weight on top, you know, just accompanying the bassoons. Now this is going to be bass clarinet as well, adding to the top line, right? Think down a ninth, right? So this is B sounding A. And then an octave below that, contrabassoon. This is just a wonderful moment for the contrabassoon in sync with the A3 bassoons above, right? It just, just has a really, really great sound. So all these lower reeds are all playing together. And while that's happening, the first violin turns into pizzicato and starts to play this downward rushing chordal passage. What fascinates me here is, like, speaking of compromising, right, everybody is compromising to an extent. So, except for a very few cases, like uh, this English horn line, which has complete integrity all the way through, pretty much every instrument is doing something, right? So, for instance, here, the firsts have to jump up a seventh to continue on uh, this sense of rushing downwards, just because this pizzicato is in a much more resonant place here on this lower A than if it were up on this top A, completing the top of the chord with these flutes and piccolos, right? Here, the first violins manage to play one complete downward scale without having to jump or cross or do anything like that. But notice here, the second violins go up a step and come back down. Here we've got it jumping up here by the violas. The whole illusion, though, is what you're seeing here as the music progresses and gets higher and less of that compromising has to happen. And that is the sense of downward rushing chords. You don't see the desperate calculations that are in here where little bits and pieces sort of jump up and get under and this line right here takes over for the downward rushing A2 piccolos. Right, And then this part of the harmony gets taken over by the oboes. I think it's just really clever, all of these little calculations that end up sounding completely and perfectly integral. Of course, the clarinets, the perfect fix-it instruments, are just constantly jumping in there and doing little bits and pieces. And the trumpets start to join in. And tenor tuba and bass tuba taking over, coming right in under the contrabassoon and bassoon, bass clarinet, and bass oboe. Notice this is ending on a C sharp, right? But the bass tuba and tenor tuba just come right in under on the same notes again. A, D, bum, 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 and so on. And there's some of that same dividing things up into fives and fours and fives again. This really reminds me a lot of Mio. And of course, Mio followed Holst. He didn't come before him. But these sort of downward rushing, uh, kind of clangorous wind chords really reminds me of the orchestration to Sweet Provençal, which just is a delightful work. And this is interesting, too. The pizzicato crescendo with the violins helping out the staccato winds. And when you get to here, they're just not needed anymore. Once the trumpets are added with their more biting staccato, it's as if that quality lends itself to these downward rushing wind chords, which are getting higher and higher every time, right? So it's another magic trick. The sense of pizzicato is going to be carried over by the listener. The instruments don't need to do it anymore. Meanwhile, horns, pesante, a6, are rushing up towards their big statement coming up on the next rehearsal figure, being played, being doubled completely in this massive unison by all the strings except for double basses, arco, pesante, so very heavily, bowed, fortissimo, 
and they're going to do something really awesome. You'll hear a taste of it as we go to the credits. So listen for all of those things. Listen for the different low featured lines giving over here between the low reeds into the tubas solely. Listen for the pizzicato downward rushing, how it sort of disappears into the trumpets and the winds as they get higher, and you just sort of sense that they're there without them being there. Listen for the little back and forth of the harps and the flutes and piccolo. Listen to the unique sound of staccato solo reed lines being doubled by pizzicato in the strings, especially right here, this lovely idea with the clarinets going so high, being doubled by very high pizzicato in the second violins and helped out by arco first violins. Listen for all of those things, and I will see you in our next installment of Uranus the magician.